This video has been sponsored by Squarespace, a simple yet powerful platform you can use to build a professional looking online presence. So recently I have had the opportunity to spend a lot of time fighting Mario bosses. For... reasons. And one thing I realized while rolling around Rolladillo's planet was that in general, I much prefer 3D Mario boss fights over 2D Mario boss fights. That really got me thinking. Why? It's all the same series, isn't it? There shouldn't be such a wide gap, and yet, there is. In service to that question, today we shall start a journey of discovery, by going all the way back to the beginning. Super Mario 64, by definition, the first game to contain 3D Mario boss fights. We're going to take a look at all the bosses Nintendo cooked up for this game and see how they adapted their boss design for the Z-axis. What trends that ended up separating 2D and 3D Mario bosses started here. How Nintendo introduced the concept of bosses in a 3D space to an uninitiated public. And most importantly, why the heck are these bosses so darn talkative? Now I dropped a lot of comparisons between 2D and 3D Mario in that opening paragraph, so it's only fitting that we start our discussion with a bit of a history lesson on 2D Mario bosses. These days, 2D Mario boss fights are predominantly defined by the jump on a turtle three times and wind variant. But that's not where they started. In the original Super Mario Brothers, you don't really fight Bowser per se. You more so just need to find a way around him. Which I actually find to be a very compelling design decision, especially for their first crack at a Mario game. And that's because it nearly perfectly matches up the objectives between the normal level sections and the boss sections. In general, Super Mario Brothers is a game about moving to the right. So it's only fitting that you win the boss fights in it by moving to the rightmost part of the screen just with a powerful enemy in the way. I might posit that such consistency helps to make these boss fights more immediately understandable to a player, because what you're doing hasn't fundamentally changed from the rest of the game. Now, get around the boss boss fights are not at all what they went for in Super Mario 64. I imagine at least in part due to the fact that it's not quite as easy to make getting around an enemy difficult in a 3D space as it is in a 2D space, since there's a whole other dimension the players can use to their advantage. But even putting that aside, it's probably not a direction they were interested in regardless, as this was a boss design philosophy that Nintendo had more or less abandoned by the time they got to Super Mario Bros. 3, and Super Mario World anyway. Speaking of... This is when we start to see the rise of jump on an enemy bosses. I won't use Super Mario World as my primary example here because I'm more familiar with it, but I'm pretty sure most of what I'm about to say applies to Super Mario Bros. 3 about as much. Anyway, bosses that you jump on are the vast majority in Super Mario World. In fact, I don't think there's a single boss in the whole game that mimics the Bowser fights from Super Mario Bros. As for why this is the case, I don't really know. It could be that they wanted to further differentiate the boss fights from the rest of the game by making them about defeating an enemy instead of just moving right. After all, providing variety is one of the main functions of boss fights. It's also possible that maybe Nintendo just felt it would be generally better for the players to more directly interact with the bosses. In any case, what we're left with are primarily bosses you jump on to defeat, which is a very natural and, dare I say, intuitive way for those bosses to end up being designed. Because let's be honest, after moving right, probably the second most ubiquitous action you take in a 2D Mario game is jumping, oftentimes on enemies. You stomp turtles all the time in normal gameplay, so when you see a large boss turtle, Obviously, your natural inclination is to jump on it. It's worth noting the exceptions, though. One would be the Resnors, which you defeat by hitting the platforms they're standing on from underneath. The others are Bowser and Big Boo, which you throw items at to defeat. It's worth noting that between these three types of bosses, most of the ways you can harm enemies in Super Mario World without needing a power-up have at least one boss where it shines as a solution, even if jumping does get top billing. That brings us to Super Mario 64, the game which added a new dimension to the Mario series, but also a game which significantly built on Mario's moveset. It can be easy to forget over 20 years removed from it, but this was the game that brought triple jumps, long jumps, backflips, side flips, and importantly for our purposes, ground pounds, punches, kicks, and dives to the Mario platformers. And with such an expanded moveset seems to have come a desire to increase boss variety. 
Just like how Super Mario World highlighted its improved throwing mechanics with bosses you had to throw stuff at, so too it would seem Super Mario 64 wanted to show off its new mechanics in its boss fights, and with so many new moves that naturally led to significant variety in the bosses. There are 9 bosses in Super Mario 64, and if you break them down based on how you defeat them, you end up with 1 you ground pound, 2 you grab, 1 you punch, 1 you run around, 3 that don't prescribe to one specific move to damage them, and only 1 you jump on. So as you can see, Super Mario 64 doesn't really have one standard template that most bosses in the game follow. Which introduces the issue of, if your bosses have little standardization between them, how do you set your player's expectations of them? In the 2D games, you defeat one Koopling and you know how to defeat them all. But how do you let the players know what to do on a given boss fight, when the way you defeat the Womp King has nothing to do with how you defeated King bob -omb? And yes, I know, technically in this game, he's the big bob -omb. But come on, in my heart, he'll always be King bob -omb, so that's what we're going with for this video. Sue me if you don't like it. Well, with regards to making sure the players know how to go about fighting the bosses, there are a few tricks Nintendo employed to subtly suggest to players what they should do. One of the major ones they used was making the bosses literally just bigger versions of normal enemies the players had already encountered. Big Bully, Chill Bully, Big Mr. I, Big Boo, and the Womp King all obviously fall under this category. They all behave just like their smaller counterparts, and are defeated in the exact same way. Even King bob -omb, who I didn't initially think was a good fit for this category, upon closer inspection, does actually fit the bill. Yeah, he doesn't try to explode on you, but the only way to damage him is by picking him up and throwing him. That is exactly how you defeat bob -omb's in Super Mario 64, as jumping on them does nothing unlike in previous Mario games, which may have very well been an intentional design decision specifically to prepare players for fighting King bob -omb and shaking them out of the bosses generally should be jumped on mindset that they may have been carrying from experience in previous Mario games. I will say, though, that they could have perhaps gotten even more mileage in terms of readability out of making the bosses big versions of normal enemies had they, in the level design, forced the players to defeat those normal enemies the bosses are based on before they encountered the boss. Out of all the bosses in the game, Big Boo is the only one that you're guaranteed to face only after defeating the regular version of the enemy he's based on. That being said, Usually, the regular enemies are placed so they'll be encountered if the player takes the obvious route to the boss, so the player will probably defeat them on their way, but aside from with Big Boo, the players always have the option of just running past and ignoring the enemies. Another way Nintendo hints at how to defeat a boss is by obvious visual weak points, although they didn't use that tactic very prominently in Super Mario 64, with only, in my opinion, two of the bosses having an obvious visual weak point, those being Irock with its eyes on its palms, and the Womp King, who has a massive X on his back. Another thing I noticed they do, is employ what I'm going to call symmetrical damage sources. Meaning that the way the boss attacks Mario, is basically the same way Mario has to attack the boss. You can see this at work in the King bob -omb fight, where the way Mario damages the boss is by picking up and throwing him. And the way the boss attacks Mario, is by picking up and throwing him. Additionally, the bullies push Mario off platforms and into the lava, which is exactly what Mario must do to them. Now, these last two are a bit of a stretch, but it could be argued that the Womp King's attacks are analogous to Ground Pound's, and Irock does attack with his hands, which could be taken as a hint that you need to punch him, but again, those two are a bit of a stretch. Now, that's all well and good, and you know what? If Super Mario 64 was released today, that would probably be enough. But Super Mario 64 was the first 3D game many of the people who picked it up had ever played, a fact I'm sure Nintendo was well aware of. And as such, it seems that they really wanted to make absolutely certain that no one was left behind in the transition. They wanted to make sure that only an illiterate fool could possibly be left confused as to how to defeat the bosses in this game. If the other tactics Nintendo employed to make their bosses intuitive were subtle, precise scalpels, then this last one was a ridiculously overt electric bone saw. Enter dialogue. But first, a message from our sponsor, Squarespace. 
It's the 21st century, and one of the great ways to get ahead these days is by starting an online side hustle. Whether you're doing art for hire, running an e-commerce business, or... I don't know, just to pick something at random, making gaming videos on YouTube. Having your own space on the internet, your own website, can only be a benefit. That's where Squarespace comes in. Between their custom templates and intuitive drag and drop interface, it's never been easier to build your very own website. And not just a, well, technically it works website, but a legitimately impressive website people might think you hired a professional to make. And for all you influencers out there, fear not, for Squarespace can interact with your social media accounts to enable the integration your website needs. Whether that be some simple links, an embedded Twitter feed, embedded YouTube videos, or all manner of other social media integrations that, honestly, I probably wouldn't even be able to come up with. So if you're ready to upgrade your online footprint, go to squarespace.com and start a free trial. Play around with the tools and see what they can do for you. Then, when you're ready to launch, make sure to use my URL, squarespace.com forward slash semicraft, to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. And hey, not only will you have a great website to show for it, but by supporting our sponsors, you'll be supporting us at Semicraft Gaming and helping us to keep these videos coming for a long time to come. Thank you for your attention, and now back to the video. Mario is not generally a series known for its dialogue, and yet of the nine boss characters in the game, five start the bosses with some sort of speech. As a point of comparison, here is the opening of the first boss fight in Super Mario World. Here is the opening of Super Mario Galaxy's first boss. And here is the opening of Super Mario 64's first boss. I'm the Big Babom, Lord of all blasting matter, King of Kabooms the world over. How dare you scale my mountain? By what right do you step foot on my mountain top? You may have eluded my guards, but you'll never escape my grasp. And you'll never take away my power star. I hereby challenge you, Mario. If you want the star I hold, you must prove yourself in battle. Can you pick me up from the back and hurl me to this royal turf? I think that you cannot. And like I said, about half the bosses in Super Mario 64 start off in a similar vein. And in most of those cases, the boss literally tells you how to defeat it. It's my theory that with the combination of this being the first 3D Mario game, and the increase of boss variety within the game, Nintendo felt the only way they could be sure players would know how to defeat the bosses is if they literally told them how to do it. That being said, not all of the pre-fight speeches are created equal. In particular, I saw a trend where the earlier in the game a boss was, the more information Nintendo tended to give in the speech, and the more explicit that information tended to be. The first, King bob not only tells you how to attack him, Can you pick me up from the back and hurl me to this royal turf? I think that you cannot! But also, how he's going to attack you. You may have eluded my guards, but you'll never escape my grasp. Which I suppose makes sense, since he is the first boss a player is likely to encounter. So a nice all-encompassing primer, if it's fitting at all, would be fitting here. The Womp King, which is also an incredibly early boss, features the same pattern of stating how he'll attack Mario, I THINK I'LL CRUSH YOU JUST FOR FUN, as well as how Mario can attack him. JUST TRY TO POUND ME, WIMP! HA! Again, it was probably important for Nintendo to be overt with what was likely going to be the second boss a player encountered. It's possible that a player coming out of the King bob fight could be left with the impression that bosses in general in Super Mario 64 are defeated by grabbing and throwing. Having the Womp King come in and crush those preconceived notions in no uncertain terms quickly thereafter was probably a good thing, ensuring that going forward players weren't asking the question of how do I grab this boss, but instead the more general and in Super Mario 64 helpful question, which of my many moves can I use to hurt this boss? Bowser also gets in on the grand speeches, but even in his first iteration, we can see that by the time the players have collected 8 stars, the designers seem to trust them enough to not spell out the boss's attacks in the dialogue. Although, since the way you attack Bowser is a bit more complicated than the other bosses, they do spend the words to go through step by step how the attack is performed. <laughs> go ahead, just try to grab me by the tail. You'll never be able to swing me around. A wimp like you won't throw me out of here. Never. Ha! He only tells you how to defeat him in the first encounter, though. In the later encounters, it's more just general threats and flavor text. He does tell you about his fire breath in the last fight, 
but I interpret that more so as a threat and for flavor in the dialogue than seriously warning the player that he's going to breathe fire in the fight. The next boss to have a speech is Irock, and while I do interpret this speech as at least somewhat instructing the player, it is certainly more cryptic than the ones we've gone over so far. No battle. Hand to hand. Theoretically, that might just be a joke in reference to the boss being just a pair of giant hands. But I think it also might be a subtle nod to try bringing your hands to the boss's hands by punching them. Which is exactly what you do in this fight. And finally, Wiggler's speech has nothing to do with how you defeat him or how he'll attack you whatsoever. What? You flooded my house? W why? Look at this mess! What am I going to do now? The ceiling's ruined, the floor is soaked... What to do, what to do... <sighs> Makes me so... MAD! Everything's been going wrong ever since I got this star. So shiny, but... Makes me feel... Strange. I suppose it does convey that the Wiggler is hostile and has a star for you to get. But by this far into the game, you'd think the boss music playing would be all the clue the players needed that they needed to defeat the Wiggler. The more interesting thing Wiggler does with dialogue is talk a bit when he takes a hit. This both provides very firm breakpoints between the distinct phases of the fight, while also making it obvious that your jumps are actually working. Because let me remind you, this is one of the last bosses in the game, and the only one you beat by jumping on. So a little reminder probably was a good idea. And that is about all I have to say about the dialogue. Certainly a bit overt for my tastes, but perhaps a necessary evil given the time frame. Now, a few miscellaneous thoughts about each boss specifically before we conclude. King bob while being a great introduction to the bosses of Super Mario 64, really isn't that compelling of a boss in his own right. Certainly, I believe the first bosses of subsequent games have introduced the concept of the game's bosses just as well without compromising their own fight's quality. But if we absolutely had to pick between either a compelling first boss or one that teaches new players effectively how bosses work in Super Mario 64, a teacher was probably the better choice. The Womp King, aside from Big Mr. I, which we'll get to, don't you worry, I think suffers perhaps the most from just being a bigger version of a normal enemy. Because quite frankly, Womps aren't that interesting to fight, certainly not compared to Boos or Bullies. That being said, the setting for the fight is pretty cool. I don't know why, but battling atop the fortress just feels more epic than most of the other boss arenas in the game. So, props in that department at least. Big Boo is quite notable for appearing in three different missions in Big Boo's Haunt, and the way they implement this repetition is wonderful. This is because the arenas progressively get more difficult each time you face him. The fight is actually pretty easy the first time when you face him in the mansion's entryway. Things get a bit more interesting when the fire is introduced on the carousel, and the fight on the balcony gives you so little real estate to work with that it becomes legitimately tricky. So in my opinion, that is some great escalation between the fights. Big Mr. I is, I guess... Technically a boss fight, since he is a big version of an enemy that drops a star when you defeat him. Even so, I'm not sure it's really fitting to call him a boss. Like, I don't even think he's actually any more difficult to defeat than a regular guy, so... As a boss, a complete underwhelming failure. If he's just supposed to be a cool star in the level, then I guess he's alright. I'll talk about both varieties of bullies at once, since they're basically the same. Now, especially in a one-on-one -on -one fight, which is how the bosses play out, if you know what you're doing, you can defeat bullies basically effortlessly, just by spamming the correct combination of moves. That being said, if you don't yet know one of the effective combos to use against them, which someone playing for the first time probably wouldn't, they are some of the most fun dynamic enemies to fight in the entire game, which does translate nicely into their boss fights. Although it would have been really cool to see a bit more escalation between the bullies fight, and perhaps end with something like a, uh, a twin big bullies fight. That being said, they're pretty cool, uh, just some missed potential there I would say. Irock definitely stands out in this cast of bosses, probably in large part because he's not just a larger version of a normal enemy. One cool detail I noticed is that it takes 6 hits to defeat Irock instead of the usual 3, because he's made up of 2 distinct hands, each of which takes 3 hits to defeat, which I think is pretty cool. Wiggler is notable for actually escalating his difficulty by speeding up as you hit him more during the fight. Which I guess is in reference to the fact that historically Wigglers would get mad if you jumped on them. That is something though that if memory serves would later go on to become a staple of 3D Mario boss fights. But outside of Wiggler and the final Bowser fights, Super Mario 64 just doesn't do much of that. 
Another cool thing about the Wiggler fight is that he doesn't actively try to attack you until you hit him, which ensures that the players aren't in any real danger until they understand how to fight the boss, which is pretty clever in my opinion. And finally, the Bowser fights. Which, one thing I will note, which is kind of interesting, they're kind of just more complex, difficult versions of the uh, King bob fights. Like, it's still the same grabbing mechanics, just adding a spin and throw to it. Which I think makes sense, because that's King bob fight is going to be the one that players are most likely to have faced before Bowser. Anyways, I'll admit, the first two are a bit anticlimactic. I understand the first one being done after a single hit, but I would have expected the second one to go for at least two. That being said, introducing the actually kind of complex Bowser boss fight mechanics early in the game allowed for the last fight to not have to waste any time tutorializing and instead be pure showdown. And what a showdown it is. Bowser has enough distinct attacks to keep a player on their toes, and in my opinion, none of them feel unfair. One of the attacks even spawns some coins, which does decrease the difficulty of the fight, but also gives a player that's taken a few hits something to hang their hope on as they fight, instead of resigning themselves to their fate. And as for the way you attack Bowser, especially in the hands of a player playing for the very first time, it's finicky, a bit of a pain to time, and overall not very reliable. And I love it for that. It provides the fight with a tension that can more than stand alongside later final boss fights in the series. The fact that even when you grab that tail for the last time, you don't know for sure if you're in the clear until you throw him one last time and successfully hit the bomb, I believe significantly adds to the fight, helping it to stand the test of time and at least in my opinion still be considered a great boss fight over 20 years later. So, what have we learned today? Well, we found that not only did Super Mario 64 bring Mario boss fights into the third dimension, but also that its expanded moveset for Mario yielded a selection of boss fights with great variety and differences between each other. To get there though, Nintendo used heavy-handed and at times a bit tacky tactics like pre-fight speeches to make sure players understood what was going on. Perhaps that was necessary for the time period the game was released in, but even so, it was far from an elegant way of going about things. And after that, we're left with a selection of bosses that certainly feel quite a bit different from the 2D bosses that came before, but also don't quite feel like what came after either. And this is actually where I need y'all's input. If this video does well enough to warrant it, and if it seems like you guys want to see it, we can continue this journey of analyzing 3D Mario bosses with the natural next step of breaking down Super Mario Sunshine's bosses. So if that sounds like something you would like to see, Make sure you tell your friends to check out this video, like it, leave your support in the comments, and subscribe so you're notified when the follow-up does come out. Additionally, if you're interested in watching me react to those bosses in real time, then you should check out my Let's Play channel, where I'm about to be wrapping up a 120 star Let's Play of Super Mario 64 on Super Mario 3D All-Stars, which much of the footage in this video came from. But anyways guys, until next time, I've been Simicraft, and I'll catch you in my next video. Goodbye. Not like from a technical ability perspective, but more so from like a, uh, a moral perspective. Um... Oh, 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 oh! Yes!